So over to you, Sarah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, good to see so many of you this evening. And thank you for having me. It's lovely to come here and be able to talk about rewilding. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So can I just check whether you can see presenter view or the full screen? Because I can switch it if you're seeing presenter view. Presenter view at the minute. Okay, just switch. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so um, tonight I'm just going to provide a short presentation looking at, well, first I'm going to talk a little bit about rewilding and, and definitions of rewilding, but I'm not going to focus on that for too long. I'm mostly going to be focusing on some of the work that we've been doing as an organisation at Rewilding Britain, looking at building the evidence base for rewilding. Um, so just a bit of a background. Uh, I'm rewilding manager at Rewilding Britain, and my main role at the organisation is to work with landowners, land managers, project managers who are rewilding land across the whole of Britain. We have a range of different scales that we work at with those um, projects, and we aim to try and catalyse rewilding through supporting them through our rewilding network. Um, I'm an ecologist by background and have previously done some work around biodiversity monitoring of impacts such as beavers, beaver reintroductions. Um, so this is quite a nice interface between the two. Um, we have a growing number of rewilding projects, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, but just in case anyone doesn't know about the organisation, we're quite a small charity. We focus on three different areas of work. So we catalyse rewilding through the network. We aim to influence policy and, and do advocacy work to try and remove some of the barriers to rewilding. And then we also engage with audiences to showcase what rewilding is and why it's so important. Yeah. Um, just quickly, and, and as I said, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but I think it's useful just to look at the definition of rewilding just so that we can all be on the same page, essentially. So our definition as an organisation is that rewilding is the large scale restorations of e ecosystems to the point where nature can take care of itself. It's not about closing the gate and walking away. <laughs> our ecosystems are quite degraded. We're missing quite a lot of pieces from those um, ecosystems. So if we close the gate and walk away, we're not necessarily going to be able to see those dynamic landscapes of natural processes leading the way. So it's very much a long term thinking, but doing some interventions at the start to try and rebuild those ecosystems, rebuild that complexity to then allow nature to take care of itself in the medium and long term. The second part of our definition is that rewilding encourages a balance between people and nature so that we thrive together. So again, it's not about excluding people from these landscapes, but about providing opportunities for us to enjoy these landscapes, for us to work within these landscapes and to support economies and businesses and jobs associated with that. And underneath that definition, we have five principles of rewilding. So these will be probably quite familiar because I've already touched on these as part of the definition. But these really do underpin all of the work that we do at Rewilding Britain and underpins all the work that network projects and others also do. So it's about supporting people in nature together. I've already touched on this. We're part of natural systems. Um, we're not separate from it. So we need to view the two together and think about coexistence and how we can work together to restore our landscapes and seascapes. Working at nature scale is a very important part of rewilding. You can rewild at small scales. You can rewild gardens. You can rewild small holdings. But to do that, you generally have to look at more of an intervention approach. If we're working towards rewilding, we're really trying to work up that scale and look more at landscape level change so that we give nature more space to create this um, dyna dynamic landscapes that we expect to see and to see these mosaics of different habitats and to be able to let nature lead the way. The main principle of re rewilding is, of course, letting nature lead, not having set outcomes, not thinking about habitat creation in a traditional sense or, or management plans, um, looking at we're going to create this amount of habitat and it's going to be this type and this is how we're going to manage it. It's really about putting the pieces back in place and then letting nature lead the way and seeing where it goes. And I think that can make rewilding quite difficult because we're very used to being outcome focused. But it can also make it really exciting because it brings in opportunities for different things to happen and for us to learn more things about rewilding. Um, one quite famous example is the Nepa state where purple emperor butterflies have returned um, to areas that we wouldn't expect to have necessarily seen them. So it's improving our knowledge of, of different species and habitats, um, as well as being a little bit of an unknown, not just for us, but also for landowners. 
And then the two final principles of rewarding are really thinking about people, but also long term thinking. So through rewarding, we can create resilient nature based economies and enterprises. We can create new jobs. And I'll share some of the data around that later in the presentation. Um, but we also need to change our thinking to be a little bit more long term. Um, often funding cycles are five, 10 years, maybe with biodiversity net gain and a few of the other things coming through, we're looking at maybe 20 to 30 years. That's still quite short term um, in terms of nature's cycles and nature's recovery. And a lot of the rewilding projects are now thinking about visions that are 100 year visions, 200 year visions. And that's quite difficult for us to change and shift into that. But we really do need to think a lot more long term in, in the approaches that we're taking. And it's definitely very much a marathon with a sprint start um, with some of the interventions that we're taking. And I've mentioned this already, but we do need to accept that in Britain, our landscapes are degraded. We are missing a lot of our what we call keystone species. Um, so keystone species are, are species that have a disproportionate impact on ecosystems. So things like beavers, wild boar, um, some of our predators like wolves and lynx, as well as some of our missing large herbivores such as elk. And this is when we start to look at trophic complexity and trophic cascades and, and the effects that bringing some of these keystone species back have on our ecosystems. And if we don't have these species here, we essentially need to try and mimic them. We won't do as good a job, but we can try to think about what sort of things might these species have in terms of their impact on the landscape. So in the absence of wild boar, we might bring, bring back proxy species. Or it might be that we go out and create some of that dis disturbance through scarifying the ground or um, uh, turning over the ground a little bit to, to mimic that behaviour. But I think when we start to think about how we can let natural processes lead, I, I quite like to use the idea of a game of Jenga. Um, it's quite a good way for me to visualise what we're trying to do when we're putting the pieces back in place for rewilding. So I've already mentioned natural processes need space. We need to look and think at the landscape level and start to think about the mosaic of different habitats. But we also need to think about putting some of the puzzle pieces back in place. Now, if you imagine a, a Jenga tower, hopefully everyone's played Jenga. Our ecosystems at the moment have taken out quite a few of those pieces. We're missing predators. We're missing carcasses in our landscape. A lot of our rivers um, have been modified. We've modified quite a lot of our habitats as well. So we've got a few gaps in the Jenga tower. And the more gaps that we have there, the, the shakier it's going to be. So as we see climate change coming in, the extreme weather coming in, that's just going to keep shaking the tower. And so the resilience of that is quite, um, quite low. So through rewilding, we're thinking about how do we put those blocks back in? either through species reintroductions or through some of the actions that we do. So things like coppicing, we can mimic bison and beaver behaviours through our own coppicing. So if we can't bring those species back, maybe we can do some coppicing of our woodlands to mimic that. And often people say that we learn how to coppice from beavers in the first place. Uh, we might install leaky dams again to mimic those missing beavers and to create some more dynamic wetlands. In the absence of predators, we might be harvesting animals and, and removing some of those herbivores to, again, be able to mimic that process. And then there's things like sustainable forestry and extracting timber through continuous canopy forestry to mimic the bison pushing some of these um, trees down. So there's lots of different things that rewilders can consider to try and think about restoring those natural processes. And we're learning all the time about how we can improve that complexity. But really, I think what I've learned um, working with rewilding projects and, and working in the rewilding world for a few years is just how complex nature is. Um, we did this animation, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago now, to try and imagine what a rewilding landscape in the uplands might look like. And I think the more I see this drawing, the more I see just the complexity that is in here and how much we've got to learn about interactions between species, between habitats, we're learning all the time about how things are changing. Um, and I think we need to embrace that complexity, but it also makes it really hard to measure the impact of rewilding. Um, so just to talk you through this illustration a little bit, you know, we've got a uh, re-meandering, re rebraided river that's been restored. There's a big beaver dam there that's holding back some of the water and creating quite a complex wetland. Um, we've got natural regeneration of trees. Um, we've also got that mixed in with grassland and other habitats and grazing animals within this landscape. And we've restored some of our predators. So we've got things like eagles, lynx, wildcats in here as well. But what's really interesting about this illustration is that we have also still got people within this landscape. Uh, we've got roads, we've got buildings, we've got people working and enjoying it. Um, but we've also got green bridges in here to maintain that connectivity. 
So again, it's really just trying to imagine that complexity um, and think about what we can do to create lots of niches for wildlife and, and also for other ecosystem services. And I just like to say that, that beavers were the things that got me into rewilding. When I went to a beaver wetland and saw the complexity uh, that beavers had restored to an area, I think I realized just how complex nature is and the, and the complexity that, that nature needs to be able to thrive. And I think that's something that we increasingly need to embrace through rewilding. The other complication that we have uh, with rewilding is that it's very much along a spectrum. There isn't one size fits all to rewilding. They're very different depending on which habitats we're looking at, where we're working, different approaches. And so it's genuinely true that every single rewilding project is unique. And I'm just gonna play this, this video, which hopefully will work. It's just got a series of some of the different photos from um, a range of the rewilding projects that we have across Britain. And, and this isn't all of them. It's just to give you an idea of the different mosaics and the different habitats that we're dealing with. So in terms of, again, trying to measure and build the evidence base for it, we've got lots of different interventions, lots of different habitats, upland, lowland, different areas. Some have herbivores, some don't. And it makes it quite complex to build a robust uh, evidence base for rewilding that isn't just based on anecdotal evidence um, and information that people are providing. So I hope that just gives you a, a bit of a flavour of some of the challenges um, that rewilding projects are facing. Um, we also started to ask the question as an organisation, you know, why do we need to monitor? Why can't we just rely on um, anecdotal evidence that rewilding is great and we should all be doing it? Well, I think many people on this call will know about the changing funding and the ever-changing policy that we're facing at the moment. Um, we need to monitor projects to be able to look at this um, funding and policy change to push back on some of the policy decisions that are being made to try and remove some of those barriers to rewilding, but also to get the la landscape scale land use change and transition that we need to see. Um, you know, there's there's ongoing discussions around driven grouse moor and what's better for biodiversity. Is it driven grouse moor? Is it rewilding? And we simply don't have the evidence at the moment from the rewilding projects to be able to answer those questions. So it's a really, really important element. Um, we know that we need to monitor for um, ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Scheme in England. There's new agricultural schemes coming through for Scotland and Wales that we will need to monitor for. There's monitoring requirements for the emerging voluntary markets, so carbon and biodiversity credits. Biodiversity net gain has um, a requirement for monitoring habitat change. And how do we do that when we're looking at landscape scale change is quite a challenge. We're seeing an increasing amount of private investment that's also going into rewilding projects, again, has reporting requirements from it. And then there's nature-based enterprises that are coming through that require a slightly different level of, of monitoring. Um, and rewilding projects are also increasingly being used for social prescribing, green prescribing. How do we start to measure not just the biodiversity side of things, but also the impact on people's well-being and health and the social economic indicators as well? So we have a growing number of rewilding projects across Britain. Um, as I said at the start of the presentation, we are supporting landowners on the ground um, through our rewilding network to try and help provide them with practical support. And one of the things that they've come back to us with is, you know, we don't know how to measure rewilding. We, have, we can't measure everything. We have lots of people coming to us wanting to measure different things. How do we actually do that? So we're trying to provide this support to them to try and build the movement, but also build the evidence base for our own policy work. And just to give you an idea of how much the rewilding network has grown, um, just wanted to include this map in here so you can start to see the number of projects that are starting to come onto the network. There's also a whole bunch of projects behind this map that are also part of the network that aren't quite ready to go public yet. So in total on the network, we have, I think it's actually now about 920 projects covering over 150,000 hectares of land that's in rewilding. Um, and we also are extending out our marine rewilding areas as well. So we've got a significant amount of land and marine across a whole range of different habitats and ecosystem types that are asking us, um, how, do they how do they monitor, how do they measure rewilding and how do we start to build that evidence base? So in terms of opportunities, we've got this rewilding network, it's Britain wide, we've got um, lots and lots of projects on there. And we want to be able to track the progress, we want to be able to track how rewilding is affecting not just biodiversity, but also ecosystem services. 
And really what we need to remember is that rewilding is new and innovative. We are trying out new things. We are trying to let nature lead the way. So I think there's a real opportunity there to start to collect a standardized data set to see what happens over time, not just to build the evidence base for rewilding, but also to inform other projects as they start to think about their own rewilding journey, give them an idea of what might change, how long it might happen, um, how long it might take to happen, and how can they then link that to some of their funding streams as well. So we have already started building some data through the rewilding network. Um, we've actually just updated this data, so we'll be releasing the update soon. But we started to build information on jobs. Um, so through the network and the samples that we have, we've seen over a 54% increase in jobs within 10 years of rewilding. Not just more jobs, but we can also see that there's an increased diversity of the type of jobs, so ecotourism as well as other things. We can see 13 times more volunteers across rewilding projects. And we've also started to build up information about livestock units, um, some information around habitat change, as well as information about interventions and species reintroductions. So the sample size of projects is now actually up to 60. Um, so we've got to update this. But we've really just been so far collecting kind of top level data. What we need to do is try and address some of these challenges. So I don't have all the answers in this presentation, but hopefully it will lead to some interesting discussion and give you an idea of where our thinking is. So as I've said, rewilding doesn't have a set outcome, makes it quite challenging for monitoring because normally you're monitoring to a set outcome. So in terms of de developing your questions and trying to think about how you measure rewilding, it can be quite tricky because you don't want to be constraining what you're doing through your monitoring and, and trying to put outcomes on something that really we want to be letting nature lead the way. That means that instead of monitoring results and outcomes, really what we need to do when we're thinking about monitoring rewilding is trying to monitor the change and trying to see how can we monitor the change in ecosystem ser services and natural processes rather than maybe looking at some of the more traditional ways that you would measure change and measure whether you've hit your outcomes. We need to think long-term change um, makes it quite frustrating for practitioners and landowners because they want to see change quite quickly, especially as they're doing quite a lot of interventions um, at the start of their project. But actually we need to accept that with these monitoring um, strategies and frameworks, we're actually thinking more long-term than that. We might initially see a dip even in some of the metrics before we start to see things um, go back up again. So again, th that long-term thinking is quite a challenge um, for some of these monitoring schemes as well as funding rewilding. When we're thinking about rewilding landscapes, um, they're not going to be following a set outcome. So they're gonna be dynamic changing landscapes. So if you imagine that landscape I showed you with the illustration, really what we're thinking about is that that will just be a snapshot. It's not always going to look like that. Trees are going to fall over. Herbivores are going to move in. They might graze some areas more one year. They might let it go a few years after that. And so you see this change of scrub and grassland and, and woodland um, changing throughout time across that landscape as we have these different natural processes coming in. And a question that I get asked a lot is, how do we know what good looks like? How do we know when we've got to where we want to get to? Well, we don't know at the moment. And although we've got some really great examples of rewilding across Britain, they're all still 20, 30 years old. So they're not really at that stage where you can say this is a rewilded landscape. Really, they are still rewilding. And I know a lot of landowners just want to know that they're doing the best for their land and they're doing the best thing and they want to intervene if it's not working in the right way it's very difficult to know whether you're on the right trajectory um, or whether things will start to balance out. So it's quite a challenge to try and work out what good looks like. And so a lot of rewilding projects are collecting data. We did a survey and an assessment of all the data that was being collected. This is just a snapshot um, page from the NEPA state and their monitoring surveys. So they're all monitoring in some way. Often they're working with, with, la with universities and volunteers to collect data. But really, they are usually um, not very standardized. Not everyone's measuring the same things. Um, and the data collection indicators just vary hugely from anecdotal evidence through to short term pieces of research that students might have completed through to maybe some more um, long term monitoring. So birds and bats, for example. But um, it just varies really hugely between the rewilding projects. Some projects are spending up to 100K on, on, on baseline surveys. Most are focusing on biodiversity surveys and not so much on the social economic side of things. So there's this variation between it, which again makes it really difficult to build that 
uh, standardized national evidence base for rewilding and be able to push back on on some of these things and, and deliver the evidence base that we want to deliver. I mentioned earlier a little bit about the rewilding spectrum. So as an organization, we're trying to put some more detail on what this spectrum looks like. So essentially, um, when we're looking at rewilding, we're trying to move down this particular graph. So the green um, spots on here are typical UK nature reserves. So they generally are smaller in size and have higher management intensity because they're working to specific outcomes. When we're looking at rewilding projects, which on here are on the in the blue and the green, so the green are international examples, the blue are UK projects. Um, you can see a lot of them are still quite small scale, but they're much lower in management intensity. And the aim that we're trying to progress rewilding projects is to move them up this spectrum. So to move them down the management intensity and increase them in size. So one great example of this is Mar Lodge up in Scotland, where they've got um, quite a large area that they're working to and quite low management intensity in that area. So what we want to start to see is these projects starting to push down that spectrum and us be able to monitor um, and measure that change. This is a slightly confusing graph because the arrow is actually going the other way. So apologies for that. But we're building a, a scoring system for the spectrum so that we can start to establish what's the project baseline against our different principles of rewilding and where do they want to be. And then we want to measure progress against that so that we can start to see how they're moving up that rewilding spectrum through the score. Um, so this is still something we're working on and we're hoping to be able to release it in the next few months for people to be able to do their own self-assessments. But really, again, it's trying to get them thinking not only about the five principles of rewilding, but how they can assess and move up that spectrum. And then the next step up from that is to try and develop a standardized monitoring framework for rewilding projects. So this is something that needs to be practical, accessible and cost effective. Not everyone will have a massive budget for monitoring their site, but we want to try and have a minimum number of indicators that everyone can measure. They can contribute that data to us. And then at the national level, we can start to pull that data together to start to show top level indicators of what's happening, how rewilding is affecting various different things um, and start to really get a standardized approach to some of the data collection. So we're trying to measure change and understand how this links to ecosystem function. And we've got different levels depending on resource and budget from the kind of basic level, which we hope everyone will monitor through to the, um, the higher up kind of, if everyone's got resource to be able to record more data. So I am gonna show you some of our thinking around it. I would just like to caveat that it's not finalized yet and we're hoping to finalize the framework and test it out on projects in the next couple of months. So please do take them with a pinch of salt, but hopefully it will give you a bit of an idea of our current thinking um, subject to changing as we start to test it on the ground. So level one monitoring is the monitoring that we would hope that all projects will be able to do. And we had a workshop with um, a selection of academics and practitioners back in May to start to work through some of these indicators. And we're also about to go out to the network and start to talk to them about feedback um, on some of these metrics as well. So what we wanted to do was try and look at ecological processes as well as biodiversity. So things like changing in vegetation and disturbance. So vegetation structure, grazing pressure, trying to look at how can we start to as assess trophic complexity. So th through things like soundscapes can start to give us an idea of that complexity about how many species are within a system using sound as an indicator of um, how complex that system is um, combined with invertebrate populations, as well as livestock units and deer numbers to start to understand how they're affecting the mosaic of habitats. We've want to test out um, or, or record information about natural processes as well. So as well as the livestock units and deer numbers, we want to start to measure human intervention because we really should expect to see lower levels of human intervention as projects progress and move up that rewilding spectrum. We also identified soil health as a key indicator um, and soil structure in particular. And we're working out the metrics around how to measure that um, from soil carbon through to, again, soil biodiversity using um, eDNA. Um, and other soil testing as well. Uh, water quality and hydrology are key elements of rewilding projects. So recording turbidity, freshwater condition, peak flows um, from hydrology can give us an idea of whether those natural processes are functioning as they should. And then we've got other indicators that are kind of quite basic, like the size of the project to see whether we are working at nature's scale. So in terms of the methods for collecting this, we're looking at trying to use technology wherever we can. So remote sensing and drones for vegetation structure and habitat change. 
uh, bi bioacoustics for soundscapes, uh, eDNA and DNA barcoding, for things like invertebrates and soil testing, alongside um, other standard approaches to water quality and, and hydrology. Was the hydrology actually will probably be picked up by remote sensing. So we're starting to build this framework to be able to see, okay, can we start to standardize this and collect data on a large scale, um, but data that's actually gonna tell us about the rewarding progress. And then we're starting to develop social economic impact. So we have struggled with the social economic and economic metrics. Um, so we, we are still doing some work on those. So if anyone has a particular interest in that, I'd be really interested to hear about it. So far, we've got uh, metrics like number of jobs, number of nature-based enterprises and turnover, contribution, contribution to local economies, number of volunteers and number of hours as a proxy to well-being as well as community engagement, social ac attitudes, so local feelings, um, and then things like health and well-being. We've been looking at how much of the site is open for public access. Can we look at number of visitors using counters as well? So I think this is probably less developed, but we really want to start to try and show how can we bring information and data in to show that, show that social economic impact as well. So I'm just going to wrap up because I'm aware I've been talking for quite a while and I think it would be good to have some discussion. But we are planning to release the framework to monitor rewilding. At the moment, we're at the stage where we're testing it with network projects to see what data we get back. We want to develop a platform to allow projects to contribute their data and store their data as well. Um, so that's something that we're going to be working on and, and give that as a service to network members. But I think as soon as we start to test the monitoring framework and, and bring in some of the projects that are already collecting data, that will give us an opportunity to really start to accelerate and, and build the evidence base for rewilding. Um, we want to carry on catalyzing and upscaling rewilding across Britain. So we'll continue to work with projects on that. And we're going out to a few different organizations to try to talk to them about rewilding some more of their land as well. We're also about to get a marine coordinator in. So we'll be doing this exercise again for how do we measure and monitoring the marine environment. Uh, we're doing a piece on financing rewilding and this will link in with the monitoring framework to try and see how can we get better financing into rewilding projects and how can we make sure the monitoring framework supports that. So that's something we're working on. And I think the finance and the monitoring combined will be a really powerful way to get more projects rewilding. And also for us to just really understand what rewilding is doing it's not a silver bullet it's not something that's going to solve all the problems and it has to be a part a part of our one part of our toolkit we have to have other things as well to support nature recovery and support people and support carbon as well as everything else but i think as soon as we start to understand what benefits rewilding can bring what are the benefits and what are the trade-offs i think that will really help us to be able to show um, how it can contribute to a lot of our targets um, and hopefully contribute to reversing um, the declines in nature that we've seen so much. We've got the State of Nature report coming out next week. So um, I'm not sure that's going to fill us with good news, but it will be good to, to start to be able to push back on some of those. Um, so that's me. I hope that's been useful. And, and I know it's been a bit of a whistle-stop introduction, but hopefully that's given you a flavour of what's happening with rewilding in Britain, but also where our thinking's at in terms of being able to collect that data and monitor it. I'm um, very happy to have a discussion now, but also if you're interested, um, I've got email addresses on there and social media, media handles and everything else. So, yeah, um, hopefully that's been good. Thank I'll you very much, much, Sarah. That's that's absolutely fascinating. And um, I love the Jenga um, model. I think that's really um, interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm very interested in collection of data and how you turn that data into useful information, um, particularly socioeconomic. And I'd love to have a talk to you about that another time. We have got some um, questions in the chat. Um, the first one to come in was from um, Alistair Scott asking, um, Alistair, do you want to um, turn your video and microphone on and ask your question directly? Start the discussion. Yeah, I could. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Uh, you can hear me okay, can you? Yeah, carry yeah. on. So, yeah, well, thank, thanks, Sarah. That was a excellent talk. Um, just just for clarity, because I'm aware I have a namesake also called Alistair Scott, who is the CEO of the Global Rewilding Alliance. So I just wanted to make clear I'm not him. <laughs> so, because obviously we, we have the same name spelling as well. 
Um, yes. <laughs> so the question was really, um, have you undertaken or done any work with academic partners drawing on the kind of systematic reviews, evidence reviews? I say this because actually the other stuff, Alistair Scott, I'm actually working with at the moment to actually do a, an evidence review using students to troll the global literature to look at the benefits. So I was just wondering, as part of your sort of evidence base, to what extent have you deep mined the existing academic research, notwithstanding your relevant point about the short time scale? Thanks. Yeah, so um, I mostly work with the practitioners. So we've been doing surveys to find out what they're doing. Uh, my colleague, Saran, um, is leading on the development of the framework um, and she has been working I guess with with the academics a little bit more. Um, we've been working with Chris Andam down at Sussex to um, start to develop kind of the methodology and help with the workshop. So we had quite a few academic um, attendees at the workshop that we had earlier this year. Um, Chris Andam I think has done some academic reviews um, to look at the evidence around rewilding and I know that we did one a few years ago now which probably needs to be updated because it's moving so fast. Um, so I would say yes, but I would say that there probably is more room for a, a more of a systematic review, especially as so many more papers are getting published. I think it's going to be an ongoing task. Um, we have tried to incorporate that into the framework that we're working on as much as possible, um, trying to be that person between, I guess, the academic review and the academic research, and then the uh, kind of practitioner side of things. Um, what I didn't mention is our ambition going forward is that we would then hopefully work with various universities um, to say, you know, this is the framework we're proposing. Is there a way to start working with universities to collect data through student placements or through other ways um, to train students coming through, but also to try and centralise some of that research that's happening, identify some of the gaps and, and support the universities going forward with filling those gaps as well. So hopefully that's answered your question. I'm going to take the silence as yes, <laughs> but happy to follow up with you, Alistair, if that's useful. Yeah, no, sorry, I did say thanks, and maybe I was still on mute. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay. Apologies. So this, uh, the second question um, in the chat was um, Tim Graham. Tim, you've put in a couple of couple of comments. Would you like to put your um, video on or talk? If you don't want to, I can read out your questions, but it's always nice to have a you know a face and a voice. No, he says there's children in the background. Well, we often all have children in the background. <laughs> okay, so I'll I'll read out your questions. Um I'll go back to them. And um, Tim said um his first question was uh, your graph looks like how Lawton likes to display display the data, why choose pushing down rather than the logical pushing up that usually represents progress? Yeah, so I actually in my presentation had them both ways because I usually prefer pushing up. Um, I don't really have a preference either way. I think the original one has that pushing down mainly to try and encourage that idea that we're, we're lowering the management intensity. And I think that's quite important to remember mm. that I work with a lot of landowners who want to intervene and manage things as much as possible because they want to see those results quickly. And that's fine in some circumstances, but I think thinking about rewilding progress, we need to be mindful that over the medium and long term, we should be reducing down the amount of management intensity because we should be letting nature lead the way. So I think that's why that particular graph is down, but I do like when for the rewilding spectrum um, progress, slide that I had you'll see the graph is going up because I prefer a graph that pushes up as well and Tim's second comment was lots of discussions are going on about um, platforms for gathering evidence is there scope to join up work across various platforms for example BES mm -hmm. um, ecological society applied ecological resources conservation evidence etc yeah, there's lots of platforms at the moment. I know that there's a few that are in development or already are um, online. I know that a few 
providers as well have developed their own platforms. Um, I think we have been talking to Conservation Evidence. We've been talking to them quite a lot about this, actually, and how we can link up to the work that they're doing. So that's definitely something that's on our radar. Um, I think we are trying to work with platforms as much as possible, whilst also thinking that actually um, trying to keep it as simple as possible for rewilding practitioners. So, you know, maybe there's APIs that we can use to bring in some things to that platform that uh, so like for example we work with the land app to help to map projects so looking at whether we can get an api to link up that platform with whatever we develop but we're very early stages of platform development at the moment um so it might be that we actually just work with others to tag onto an existing platform rather than setting up our own um that's something that our data scientist is working on okay and of course the gathering data is 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 great, but uh, it's only really useful if you can turn it into um, information. And that's always the thing with student projects. You know, it's not the data, it's the what can you do with it afterwards. And that that is actually takes more resources. Yeah, and so we're looking at things like, um, is there a way to store some of the original data as well? So that as um, technologies change or as things progress, we will still have that original data to allow analysis to happen on it, as well as maybe some analysis on the platform to interpret some of the data that's coming through. So yeah, absolutely crucial point is how can we start to actually turn that into information that's usable? Yeah. Um, and Florina, um, I don't know if you want to make your point, Florina. Sure, yes. Um, thanks, Sarah, for this fascinating talk. Um, I'm Florina Bartmann. I'm currently working for the Librium Center of Nature Recovery at Oxford University, and I, I'm sure you're in contact with some of my colleagues. Um, I'm in the social science research group, and we're currently thinking about how to measure these aspects and how to explore sort of social and cultural values and how they change on the rewilding and nature recovery. So really happy to chat with you about possibilities of sort of engaging with social scientists and indicators that we can come up with um, to really help also monitor sort of these societal aspects. Yeah, you hosted our workshop back in May. We came to, to your venue to host it. But yeah, I would say, I mean, I'm not a social scientist. Um, I'm an ecologist by trade so it may I I think that we recognize that that social side of things is underdeveloped at the moment in the framework it's not really delivering what we want it to deliver so I think what we'll probably do is release the biodiversity side and the ecology side of the framework first and then we're definitely open to working with um, other people about how do we develop those social indicators at the moment they I think you mentioned it in your um, comment they are based on quantity and not quality and actually the social side of things requires more of a, a quality based approach um, so yeah that's something we definitely need to do more work on to be able to find something that actually delivers that that data in the best way possible sounds great looking forward to it just to add to that um, as a, a dual qualified landscape and ecology professional um, there's quite a lot in um in the landscape discipline which gives you metrics which um, could be very useful from landscape assessment to historic landscape assessment and and future modeling mm -hmm. um i'd like to ask one question um before we throw this open to to anyone um if we're letting nature take its um take control how are people responding to, um, shall we um, use the word novel ecosystems, new natives, um, new species coming in, um, that kind of um, changing into a future? It's always worried me the term rewilding because it has a sort of a backward looking. Mm -hmm. um, and we live in such an um, extreme time of um, environmental change that I think as ecologists, we're all aware that uh, we can't really go back in time. Uh, we might be able to put in some of the things that were there before, but actually the end result is going to be quite different. Yeah. Uh, I wonder how that is being dealt with. Yeah, I think I completely agree with you. And I think, um, I mean, our position is that it's not about going back. It's, it's looking back and finding inspiration from the past. So I think it's important to see and look back to what species were here before. 
Um, I think it's also important to look at what species are still in existence in other countries that are similar. So often Scotland, for example, looks for inspiration in Norway because they, they've got similar ecosystems. So I think it's important to see where those missing pieces are, where are those missing Jenga blocks. And I think that's useful because it gives us a bit of an idea about why our ecosystems are currently behaving in the way they behave. So Scotland, very high levels of deer. That's not just because of the absence of predators, that's other things, but you know, it gives us an indication that there's something missing there. We need to restore that balance. But every rewilding project I speak to knows that we're developing a landscape of the future. And so apart from non-native invasives, which obviously they, they need to control, there is consideration to our changing climate and how that's going to affect. So I was having a discussion with Carafran in Southern Scotland this week, actually, They've done a whole load of tree planting because there's no seed source there. They're now thinking about are there other species that aren't considered to be native to southern Scotland, but actually they might need to plant to make it future proof for those changing climates. And so they're looking a little bit further south. So kind of northern England, Cumbria sort of way to see, OK, there's some species that are thriving there. Maybe maybe we need to start planting those. And I think generally there is that acceptance that. I think within reason, I mean, we're not going to start bringing in like eucalyptus or anything, but I think there is opportunities there to think, you know, how how is our climate changing? It's going to affect some species. And, you know, we need to start thinking about the resilience of that. And if a species fits a role that's missing from a native species, then then that's OK, as long as we're kind of letting nature lead the way and, and think about those natural processes. And I was saying to Carafran that, you know, they could plant some species if it's not suitable for them. Those plant those trees just won't survive. But if it is suitable, they'll do well. And that's an indication of the changing climate there. Yes, I mean, that's um, the argument for calling it wilding rather than rewilding. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't I think but... it's um. Yeah, I think it's starting to, I think a, a few years ago, it was still quite a toxic term. I think generally it's starting to be more accepted now. And I think as we start to provide real examples of what it looks like in Britain, we take away some of that polarisation of what it means because we've got a whole bunch of real examples now that people can see what we mean by rewarding. But I don't really mind what we call it, to be honest. We can call it wilding if we want to. Yeah. Yeah. Um open to comments who else has got any opinion comment anything they'd like to say we've got oh we've got about 10 minutes come on you're not usually <laughs> not usually silent richard's got his hand up yeah go on richard Oh, uh, that was a great talk, Sarah. Uh, really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I, I'm a big fan of, uh, of of rewilding or wilding or whatever you want to call it, letting ecosystems find their find their own way. And um, I mean, I guess that's that that's partly why you're sort of trying to concentrate, I guess, on monitoring techniques that that look at ecosystem functioning and processes more than just looking at species composition. But I wondered whether um, I did notice that, that that the standard sort of biodiversity indices and, and so on were completely lacking, uh, completely absent rather in your in your list. Do, do you think they don't have a place at all, or or do you think sometimes we know enough about the kind of habitats that are likely to be created to be able to do something meaningful with those standard techniques? Yeah, so I need to update that slide because actually our current thinking mainly. For, for a couple of reasons, but also because of the way some of the financial markets are going, we do have species included in that kind of basic level now. And we're looking at are there, can you measure kind of three species group to give you an indication? And those generally are including birds, bats um, and invertebrates as well. So they won't they probably won't be absent. Um, but I think when we started, we were really trying to focus on the ecosystem function because actually what you'll probably see in a rewilding landscape, and I'm going to say probably because I still don't think we truly know, but you're going to see some species moving in when it's su suitable for them. And then as the rewilding projects start to evolve, those species probably won't live there anymore because they won't be suitable. And then other species will move in. So I think where we start to think of these dynamic landscapes, we're going to see trade-offs, we're going to see change over time. And we were trying to think about what metrics can show us the general progress rather than show us 
necessarily those kind of individual species losses that we might see over time. So I think species will feature. Um, I think it's important to anyway, we've got we've got loads of data about birds and we know that it links up to national schemes, for example. Um, but what we wanted to try and focus on were the things that would actually show us that ecosystem function, which is why we looked at things like soundscapes, kind of remote sensing of habitat change, hydrology and things like that to, to really give us an idea of how those ecosystems were functioning. And I think that's why we also want to pilot them on some projects as well to see what data we get from it, because it might be that the data isn't actually suitable and we might need to have another look at the framework again. Thanks very much. No problem. Annie, you've got your hand up. Annie's going to give me a tricky question now. I know she is. Yeah, she's on mute as well. I, I know that I just, the trickiest thing is getting off of mute, isn't it? Um, yeah. No, I'm not. I was trying to think of a really hard one, to be fair. But <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I was just going to say, so uh, obviously, like you say, as this, as Wilding Rewilding progresses, um, and you're going to see landscapes changing and different species coming in and going out and that kind of thing. At the moment, um, on a lot of our reserves and that kind of thing, we're very focused on individual species, those species that we have which are endangered or got their own problems and that kind of stuff. So on like a, a moving landscape, if you like, like that, that's, that's forever changing, there's going to be species that come and go. Do you foresee that there might be a bit of controversy or issues there with like those more kind of endangered species that people are quite quite keen to sort of protect their habitat yeah so i'll use an example um, i'm going to use the nepa state because it's one of the easier examples to use um they've got turtle doves they've got nightingales they've got purple emperors there they're absolutely terrified of having a designation put on them because if they get a designation for those species, it's going to restrict the amount of rewarding that's happening. Mm -hmm. And they are very open to say that those species are there now and that's great. But in the future, they might not be. Um, and that's something that we need to accept. But it is quite a hard thing because at the moment, those are their flagship species. So how do you say to people in a few years time that maybe those species aren't, aren't there anymore? Um, I think it's all about the shift in mindset that we need as part of rewarding and accepting that there is that change and there is that flux and there's that dy dynamic landscape that we get from rewarding. It's not going to be easy, but I think it's definitely a really important part of the conversation to be able to show that that things do change and that's okay. Um, and that hopefully if we're rewarding enough land, those nightingales or turtle doves, if they move on from net because it's not suitable anymore, they'll have someone ne somewhere next door that they can go to as well. And that's why we that's why the scale is important because we need to have these mosaic of different opportunities so that those species don't disappear; they just move to a different part of the landscape. Do you, sorry, I'm going to ask another one if that's okay. Do you think that because obviously in in places like Scotland where a lot of this is happening, they've got the vast kind of areas. In England, though, is that that's obviously going to be much more restricted, isn't it? Just because of of how developed it and how populated it is. So, is there space for that, or are we just kind of hoping that we can progress it as as much as we can? Obviously, so we've done some modelling work um, with Leeds University to look at where can we achieve thirty percent rewilding across Britain, and that's not just thirty percent across Britain. That's thirty percent at the devolved nation level. So we've mapped out and modelled. 30% of England where rewilding could happen just based on the habitat type and the connectivity. And there's definitely space. Um, we need to think about our land choices. So a lot of that land is driven grouse more. There's a lot of space that's driven grouse more. So there's some conversations to be had about whether we want to keep driven grouse more, whether we want that to transition. A lot of it is um, low grade farmland, low grade agricultural land. So again, it's thinking about can that land produce something for nature and ecosystem services better than it can currently produce food. Um, and the National Food Strategy for England gives a really good account of where we have space for nature that isn't going to affect our food production. So yes, there is space, probably not as much space as in Scotland, but there's definitely vast landscapes, especially in the uplands um, of Northern England, where we can do things differently and we will have that space for landscape scale change. Um, but also even in the south of England, there's the Will to Wave scheme that's trying to connect NEP with the Sussex Kelp project. Um, that's looking at quite big corridors and through some of the landscape recovery that we're seeing as well through Elm, we are starting to see that change. It's probably more of a mosaic, but there's certainly space for it. Um, we just need to think about how we can start to work together more and have the funding for that level of change. No Thank you.
Alistair, I think you're probably going to have to be the last question because we usually try and finish. Um... Well, as I've already asked a question, maybe if there's anybody else, I'll shut up because I've already asked one. So if there's somebody else that's also got a hand up, then that's fine. I can't see anybody else with a hand up. And I have got people spread over several pages on my screen. I haven't managed to compress it down. Um, well, I, I, I can ask you very quickly anyway, because it, it really revolves around the part of the point I made about the quality of indicators, uh, but it's around metrics. And you introduced yourself as a, I think it was a landscape architect. Did you say, I'm, I'm a planner, at North, so I'm a registered planner, charter planner. And my interest is in, in, in obviously planning policy and the interface with the natural environment. But to me, too many people use quantitative metrics. And I think a lot of the rewilding experience could benefit from more qualitative based metrics, which enables people to tell stories about the benefits that are happening. And it, I suppose it was really the extent to which maybe those elements could provide that people human nature connection, which actually doesn't, isn't calculated by the square root of a baked bean can type of approach, but is actually much more of a, um, of the telling story. And I just wanted to the extent to which that could be something that could be useful to talk about. I'll be very happy to talk to you offline about that. So anyway. Definitely. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, um, we are working with projects who are, have um, residential artists, um they also are doing storytelling but yes i think i agree i completely agree with you that's actually the more powerful data to to showcase the benefit of rewilding is actually that storytelling so yeah i, I think um it's difficult to to kind of standardize that and bring that together as an evidence base but it's certainly an important part of building that evidence base going forward so yeah i'd love to talk to you about that it, it and, was an me. and not a landscape architect i'm an ecologist it, it was me that said i'm dual qualified I'm a landscape architect, um, management type, as well as being an ecologist. And I mentioned landscape metrics and landscape character assessment as a way of, um, a way of, uh, well, it combines really the quantitative and the qualitative. Um, um, if nobody else has got any further questions, there's none in the chat, I can't see any hands up. Last call for questions or comments. Okay, well, I think we should all say thank you very much to Sarah. That was brilliant. It's really interesting. Um, Mark, starting with clapping. Um, very surprised you didn't have a question or comment, Mark, but you know, another time maybe. Um, and I'll say thank you very much. Um, our next meeting will be on the third. Thursday in, um, in October. Uh, Richard or Annie, would you like to comment on who is presenting and the title of that? Richard, I'm going to give it to you if that's okay because you had the conversation <laughs> with him. <laughs> well, actually, um, I don't have a confirmed speaker and I don't want to embarrass somebody else who's on this call who's involved in finding the speaker, <laughs> uh, not Annie, somebody else. Um, but it will be around um, around the idea of, um, of of common themes in habitat restoration. So it kind of links a little bit to uh, what we've just heard about. Um, and we're hoping that we'll be able to confirm a speaker and an exact title sometime over the next couple of days. And we'll be putting it out on, on LinkedIn. And um, if you've attended this meeting, if you signed up for it, you should get information about the next one. Um, and we can guarantee it will be exciting and interesting, won't it, Richard? We can guarantee that. Yes. Um, so I'd say thank you very much and um, goodbye, everyone, except the committee who've now got to stay on for a committee meeting. So hope to see you all in October and November. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Sarah. Bye. Thanks very much. It's great. I'm going to stop recording.